Joel chapter 3, it's after the book of Hosea near the back of the Old Testament. It's good to be back. Um, appreciate those who filled in. Appreciate Sebastian last week at homecoming. Uh, appreciate Noah and Sandra and Paul the week before that. And they always do a wonderful job. And I appreciate Jacob and he loves preaching so you'll get to hear him again. And uh, it's good to be back but it's good to know we can leave the pulpit in good hands when I'm gone. Again, we're going to be looking in just a moment at uh, Joel chapter 3, the first 12 verses of Joel chapter 3. You know, uh, I have been out of the pulpit. We actually, for part of that time, took a, a family vacation. And it's the first time we had been on vacation with all of our kids, our three kids, the first time since 2017 when they leave the nest it's hard to get them all back in it's hard to get one of them back in it's really difficult to get all three of them back in and we had a, a lot of fun one thing that uh, our family enjoys and it really comes from Karen's side of the family is when we unite uh, everybody loves to play board games or card games or group games everybody that is except me uh, <laughs> I don't know why that is, because I grew up with my nanny and papas in Evergreen, and they used to play Rook every Saturday night, and I loved it, but for some reason I have lost that passion, so I'm probably the least social person you would know on those nights. Uh, usually as they are playing cards, I'm reading a book, or this time I was trying to watch the Olympics and trying to hear the Olympics amidst all the laughter that was coming in the room. Uh, where I was. But a little known fact is that I actually do like jigsaw puzzles. You can do those slowly and gradually. It, it, it's not a rush. You're not really uh, competing. And uh, uh, we did not take one on this vacation, but usually as we go into the winter, I'll purchase either a 500 or a 750 or 1,000 piece puzzle. Usually it's the first two. Um, just in case we get a three-day snow and we have that time when we're in and and I enjoy working puzzles if you're a puzzle maker and probably everyone in here is attempted there is one necessity you must have the picture on the cover of uh, the box and if you've ever worked a puzzle with multiple people usually it's like you're a tug of war as you're trying to pass it around and, and figure out how is all of this going to come together? And so you begin that puzzle, and most people begin to build around the outside uh, pieces, and you begin to build uh, on the inside. But you really need um, you really need that cover, that picture. You know, this world and what we're living in is a world of chaos as we look at it. But really, it's a world of order as God is orchestrated. Even the chaotic things, God is working out toward his will and God has given us the Bible and the Bible is is in a way like um, that picture on the box of the puzzle and, and some of the pieces have already been fulfilled as we look at prophecies specifically regarding the first coming of Jesus that have already been fulfilled uh, but yet there are other prophecies in the Bible that are yet to be filled and these are the missing pieces. These are the pieces that will come in toward the end of time and give us God's picture of history. So again, this morning we're looking in the book of Joel and it's been uh, a few weeks since we last looked at the book of Joel. We finished with the last five verses of chapter two. Uh, this afternoon, Karen and I, uh, this evening rather, are going to have the privilege of eating dinner with our only daughter, Whitney. She turns 30 today. Can you believe that? A lot of you remember when she was born. And whenever we head out in the western part of the state, I love to look at the Blue Ridge Mountains, and maybe you too. And you remember last time when we were in Joel 2, we talked about uh, the uh, scenery of the Blue Ridge Mountains and how as you maybe leave toward Lynchburg and you look out that way, it seems as if the mountain ranges are stacked up closely just like dominoes. 
But in reality, uh, the, the, the truth is this, some of those mountains are many miles behind other mountains and such are the prophecies in the word of God. A lot of these prophecies, they happen consecutively, but not necessarily instantaneously. For instance, when we looked at Joel 1, we saw events that were happening in Joel's day, yet as we move into chapter 3, we're going to see events that are not only in Joel's future, but actually in our future. And God, the master puzzle maker, is orchestrating all of this and working it out toward his desired end. No single person can stop it. No single nation can hinder uh, his plan. And so as we look at it today, I want you to look with me uh, in just a moment at uh, these verses here in Joel chapter 3. It says, yes, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and take them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there because of my people, my inheritance, Israel. The nations have scattered the Israelites in foreign countries and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people. They bartered a boy for a prostitute and sold a girl for wine to drink. And also Tyre, Sidon, and all the territories of Philistia, what are you to me? Are you paying me back or trying to get even with me? I will quickly bring retribution on your heads, for you took my silver and gold and carried my finest treasure to your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks to remove them far from their own territory. Look, I am about to arouse them up from the place where you sold them, I will bring retribution on your heads. I will sell your sons and daughters to the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a distant nation. For the Lord has spoken, proclaim this among the nations, prepare for holy war, rouse the warriors, let all the men of war advance and attack. Beat your plows into swords and your pruning knives into spears. Let even the weakling say, I am a warrior. Come quickly, all you surrounding nations, gather yourselves, bring down your warriors there, Lord. Let the nations be roused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit down to judge all the surrounding nations. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we're thankful that, God, you are in control of history. As we look around many times, as we see the news events of our day, it seems to be chaos. And, and in the world's eyes, it is. But, God, you're a God of order, and you're orchestrating, even as we heard in the song, the messy things to bring out good. And we give you the thanks that you're in control and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we look at uh, this prophecy in Joel chapter three, um, really it's important that we understand the setting and we see it really in verse one. Uh, uh, Joel, the prophet there is saying, yes, in those days, and at that time, now, back when we were in English class in high school, uh, we used to look at uh, and say, what is the antecedent? What, what is this referring to those days? What is that time referring to? Well, we know very clearly it's pointing back to what Joel had just said at the end of chapter 2. And it speaks about a time before the great and terrible day of the Lord will appear. We see that in chapter 2. In, in verse 31. And we see, uh, as we noted last time, uh, this time, this day of the Lord will be marked by cosmic disturbances, supernatural wonders, the salvation, the ultimate salvation and securing of those who are saved and the damnation of those who are not. And so around Jesus' first coming, we noted last time, uh, we see sort of the first fruits of this. For instance, uh, right before Jesus died when he was on the cross, the sun was darkened in a miraculous way. We noted how uh, 10 days after Jesus' ascension at Pentecost, how uh, there were various wonders where people were able to hear Peter preaching, even though they did not understand the language, they were able to interpret 
interpreted supernaturally. And so we see sort of a first fruits or a preview, we might say, uh, of what is described here in Joel chapter 3. But I think it's very clear that what we have here today is more than that. There's more to come. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at this last chapter, and we're going to look at the consequences of that coming day, the results. What's going to happen to those who are in the Lord? What's going to happen to those who are not? We're going to look at this future time, and consequently, uh, we're going to close out this study with a bang. And in all of this, we're going to understand that God has everything in his hands. Isn't it good to know that? Isn't it good when we turn on the television, you turn on one news station or another news station, and they always want to put us in a state of panic. If this happens, you're going to be in real trouble. If this happens, you're going to be in real trouble. And it's almost like they're preying on the fact that they can keep us stirred up. We need to remember that God is in control. He's like a master chess player. He is working everything out toward his desired end. And we're going to see this over the next uh, few weeks. So as we look at these first 12 verses of Joel 12, I want to really note two things or two results of the coming day of the Lord. But we need to go back for review because it's been a few weeks. The day of the Lord, usually when you see that, that word day is going to be capitalized. It's not a day. It's not just another day, but it speaks of a specific day when you see the day of the Lord. And that's very interesting that there are multiple times when the day of the Lord is used. Uh, for instance, in the Old Testament, we might say when God parted uh, the Red Sea so that the Israelites could go out of Egypt, and then when he drove dropped that water on the Egyptians who were pursuing them, that was a day of the Lord. That was a day when God acted in a way of deliverance and in a day of judgment. And so it's not just like any day when you go out and you see things that happen, but the day of the Lord is a specific day when God acts clearly and, and, and in a, and a non-normal way uh, to bring judgment and many times Deliverance And ultimately, the day of the Lord, as we read through the New Testament, speaks to the events in and around Jesus' second coming. And I believe Joel is leading us toward that. This coming day is going to be both a good day and a bad day. It's going to be a good day for those who are in Christ. It's going to be a bad day for those who aren't. And Amos, God warned his own people are those who thought they were his own people, of misjudging him on that day. In Amos chapter 5, in verse 18, he says, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. What will the day of the Lord be for you? It will be darkness and not light. In other words, in Amos' day, uh, who was an 8th century prophet, he was warning the people of that day. You think you're going to be ready for that day? You think it's going to be a good day for you? It will not. And so as we see uh, this from Amos, we know that, that it's going to be a day of division. It's going to be a day when some people will rejoice and a day when other people will not. It's going to um, be a day of not good standing for some. So as we look at the day of the Lord, there are really two things we want to note. There's going to be a day of individual accounting. But also, and Joel brings this out here it's going to be a day when nations are brought to account. And specifically, Joel is dealing with this issue, not necessarily the individual accountability, but the accountability of nations, of social structures, of people groups who have come together and set themselves against God's plan. People who have rejected God, who have rejected His people have rejected his purpose. And so I want to divide our look this morning really into to two parts. Uh, the retribution of the nations who have set themselves against God and the restoration of the people of God. First, I want to look that God speaks of this day of retribution against his enemies. Not everyone is going to be ready on that day. We just saw that in in Amos. It's going to be a day of reckoning. It's going to be a, a day, the scripture says, when everything that is kept secret will be manifest. It's going to be a day when those who hypocritically 
portray themselves as being Christians, but really are not, will be revealed for who they are. They're going to be those that we might judge who are not in the Lord and our own uh, fallible and limited understanding who may actually be in the Lord. But it's a day that God knows, and it's going to be a day of reckoning a day of judgment. I shared uh, about six months ago about a bad experience that I had in college. Um, I um, got in trouble with the dean of students. Uh, I was making my way to class. You're probably saying, Rick, why were you driving to class anyway? It wasn't but walking maybe 100 yards. Uh, but I think I must have been late for class. My friend must have been late for class. And so he jumped on the hood of my car. And there, through Hampton, Sydney, I'm riding with a guy that had whitish blonde hair, if that didn't stick out, riding on the hood of my car in the midst of uh, BMWs and sobs. I had a 16-year-old 1971 Impala that looked like a tank. In other words, you couldn't miss it. And so I thought I, my friend had arrived safely, and I thought I was okay until the next day. This was before the day of email. In my post office box, I had a notice from Dean Lewis Drew, Mr. Caldwell, I'd like to see you in my office tomorrow. I knew what it was about. There was no mistaking. I was sweating over it. And let's just put it this way. It wasn't a good day uh, for me as nice as, as Dean Drew was. The scripture says that there's coming a day of accounting, and for many people, it will not be a good day. Notice what he says in verse 2. I will gather all the nations and take them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Notice God is the one who is taking. Many times we might look at the events of the world and we say, God, don't you know what's happening? Can't you see politically? Can't you see what's happening? And God is not panicking. God is orchestrating. Notice he's active here. He's gathering the nations and he's taking them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now there is no literal valley of Jehoshaphat. Some people say this would refer to Armageddon. Some would say other battlefields. Um, but it really means the valley where God will judge. And so more than where it's located is what it's describing. They're going to be brought to a place of judgment because it says, I will enter into judgment with them there. And so God was going to judge, and he is going to judge in that day individuals, but he's going to judge the nations. But notice of the sins of the nations, there's one that is specified. Because of my people, my inheritance, Israel. In other words, the nations will be judged for mistreating God's nation, Israel. Now we see how they had mistreated them. They scattered the Israelites. Uh, they divided up the land that was given uh, to the nation of Israel. And then look at verse 3. They cast lots for my people. In other words, God had called Israel among all the nations, not that it was anything special in and of itself, but uh, God had chosen Jacob and not Esau. He had chosen Israel. But notice how the nations treated them. They cast lots for the people. They bartered a boy for a prostitute. In other words, they sold an Israelite boy just for one night's pleasure with the prostitute. And not only that, they sold a girl uh, not for just one bottle of wine that would be gone in a night. In other words, they had treated the individuals of Israel as if they didn't even matter. And that's important for us to know. People matter to God. And, and we're not ever to minimize the value of people, but they had mistreated the people. They had invaded the land. They took the people. They took the land. He goes on to say, you took the silver and the gold and, and you removed them in verse 5 and carried out my finest treasures to your temple. In other words, they had totally disregarded God. Now, in verses 4 through 8, we see three, well, two cities in a, a territory, uh, Philistia, that is called out specifically. These places, Tyre and Sidon, were north of the Philistine territory. Uh, the Philistine territory would be along what's the Gaza Strip now, but you had Tyre and Sidon and, and Philistia, and 
the thing that they all shared in common, they were coastal cities. And so they were cities of trade. And so you can see where the bartering and the slavery and the slave trade and all of this was happening, where they were located. A lot of people said, why in this prophecy that's bringing the judgment of ungodly people are these seemingly insignificant people brought out? In other words, why didn't he speak of Egypt, or why not Babylon, or Assyria? Well, we don't really know, but we know that the uh, initial readers in the context, even though we don't know the context, they probably were very aware of the wickedness of these cities. We know the Philistines were always set against God. Uh, Goliath was a Philistine. We know that David, even when he tried to hide and settle in among the Philistines, that they turned against him uh, very quickly. Tyre and Sidon, we know that they were wicked places, not just in this context, but throughout Scripture. And, and for instance, in Ezekiel um, chapters, I think it's 26 through 28, it, it speaks of uh, the wickedness of the prince of Tyre and, and how wicked this area was. In fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, when he was rebuking the cities who were rejecting him, they said, it'll be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon than it will be for you in the judgment. And we say, well, what does that mean? Well, in the same context, he told another people, it'll be more bearable for Sodom than for you. And so in Jesus' uh, categorization of it, we see that the people of the Tyre and Sidon, of Tyre and Sidon would be much much like uh, the Sodomites. And so the question is, what would God do to these people? I think it's first important for us to understand that Tyre, Sidon, and Philistia are just representative of a larger group of nations who have rejected God. They're merely a representation of a greater group. Uh, uh, nations who have set themselves against God historically. And so here we're taken really to that final day of the Lord. And in verse 9, we see what is going to happen. God summons the nations to fight against him. Now, what military leader would summons the opponent to come and fight? Usually we would tell the opponent, retreat, acquiesce. But God, in almost a taunting way, he's calling out the nations and he's saying, assemble yourselves. He, he is orchestrating and will be orchestrating uh, these future events that is coming. But God does more than issue a summons. Have you ever received a summons to court? I have. I've had to be a witness. It said you must be there. You must be there uh, in, in penalty of law if you don't show up. And so that summons in a way says you better be there, but you have to get yourself up and show up in court. But what God is doing in this future time is more than a summons it would be actually as if he would go to the house and drag you to the court. And that's what he's going to do in that day with the nations. He's not just summoning. He's not just saying you must do this. He says you will do it. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 4, it speaks of that wicked ruler Gog and the wicked nation Magog. And he says, I will turn you around. I will put hooks in your jar, jaws and I will bring you with all of your army. In other words, God, who, who is working out this puzzle and bringing it to completion, he's drawing all the nations to a battle. In fact, we see here that he is saying, beat your plows into swords. They, these are his enemies he's talking about. You're pruning knives into spears. In other words, um, uh, instruments that were for plowing and cultivating and harvesting, he's saying, reshape them into uh, weapons of war. And he says, come quickly, gather yourselves, bring down your warriors there. But in verse 10, he says, let even the weakling say. In other words, he's saying, Everybody come to this battle site. Everybody come, and I'm against you. And Joel is telling us here that God will judge the nations in that day, that, that they will be brought down, and God, verse 12, it says, will sit down to judge all the surrounding nations. And so here is God. He's called out. He's told them what to do. He's drawing them to this future battle. We're going to look at it more next week. And we see 
that God is orchestrating it all. And listen to this. Everyone who is not aligned with the Lord will be judged. He's going to judge nations. There are going to be nations that have set themselves against God. They'll be judged that day. And he will also judge individuals. I wonder today if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Well, that day when God calls everyone to account, it's so important that you say, I'm with Jesus. You see, there were even religious leaders in that day that thought they were spiritual, but they weren't with Jesus. Listen to what it says in Luke 14 and verse 31. What king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 men to oppose another with 20,000 men? If not beforehand, will he not send a delegation and ask for terms of peace? In other words, knowing what you know about God, don't you want to be at peace with him now? You can by trusting in Jesus Christ. And so we see here before we move on, and, and very importantly, uh, I want us to note the restoration of Judah. We've seen the retribution of the nations. And, and a large part of that judgment is how they treated Judah. But I want to look at the restoration of Judah. And this is quickly but it's important that we'll look at it. I want you to note God's plans for his people. He said, yet in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. In other words, he doesn't speak of all Israel. If you understand uh, Old Testament history, and, and uh, it was brought out uh, in our study by Daniel during uh, Sunday school, there was a time of the divided kingdom. And Judah maintained the Davidic line, maintained uh, the holy city as Jerusalem, maintained the Levitical priesthood, and maintained the promise. And so as we look at it here, he says, I want to restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, Paul speaks in Romans chapter 11 uh, to the Gentiles, and he said, though you, the wild branch, had been grafted in to the tree, how much more can the natural branch be grafted back in? And, 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 and it's my understanding in the future that God is going to do a drawing of Judah to him. Not every Jew will be saved, and every Jew that is saved will only be saved by coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We know not every Jew will be saved because he doesn't include the northern kingdom here, but there will be a remnant and that remnant will see Jesus for who he is. And there will be those who will finally see him and understand him. He says, I'll restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. He says in verse seven, I will rouse them up from the places where you sold them. People will say, Rick, how could he do that with Judah? It's been Thousands of years, they're dispersed. They've intermarried. He can find the puzzle pieces. He can find them. He's orchestrated it, and he's working it out. Of the millennial time, it's said in Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 23. Listen to this. In those days, ten, mi ten men from nations of every language will grab the robe of a Jewish man tightly, saying, let us go with you. We've heard God is with you. Now, I'm saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. I'm a Gentile believer, and I am secure. But I believe God still has a plan for his nation to fulfill what it's fulfilled. Not all of it, but a remnant of it, a remnant of it. So we see God's retribution against the nations who have opposed him and God's restoration of his people, and God is working toward that end. You know, one of the most frustrating things of working a puzzle is when you get to a 500-piece puzzle, 497 pieces have been put, and you have three pieces left, but there are four pieces missing on the puzzle. The first thing you think is, did I buy this puzzle new, or did I get it? at a thrift shop. But then you do what? You go into a frantic search and you try to find it. 
I know someone that even found it in the pocket. They dropped the last piece in the pocket some, but usually you're looking around. But it's very frustrating when you never can find it. And here's that puzzle with 499 of the 500 pieces in place, but it's not the complete story. Listen, that's not the way history is going to unfold. Every piece, every prophecy is going to fit in place by place as God has ordered it. And we are going to see what God's plan is. Don't you want to be a part of that plan? Don't you want to know Jesus Christ today? Don't you want to be on the winning side? Don't you want to say, Lord, today I believe you. I trust you. I trust you with my future. I trust you with this nation's future. I know, God, you're working a plan, and I'm with you. Maybe today you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is a day. I don't care what your background, what your history, what you've done, what you've not done. Today is a day to say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I don't understand everything about you. I don't understand all that you're working, but I trust you and I know that you have not only the future of this world in hand, but you have me in your hand. And maybe today you want to say, God, I'm a sinner. I need you as my Lord and Savior. Maybe today as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you say, I want to be a part of the plan for reaching people for you. We have a great opportunity. We've got a big evangelistic crusade coming to this area. We'll be talking more about it in the weeks ahead. What an opportunity. Next week, we'll look at each one, reach one. Opportunity to visit, invite someone to come to hear the gospel as it's presented. But God is working. We need to be working with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. That, Lord, you are a sovereign God in control of all. Father, you're working out your purpose, and we don't understand everything about it. God, we, we try to understand it, but, Lord, if we'll just follow your word, Lord, you'll lead us into truth. We thank you, God, that you love us, that you have a plan for us. We thank you for awakening us today and giving us another day on this earth. Lord, may we live each day for you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.